start now. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Elendical Elias John. Uh, Dr. John is an associate professor of nephrology uh, at the Christian Medical College, Valor, India. Um, he uh, he trained uh, uh, he trained at in, in the Goa University where he did his MBBS and MD and his DM nephrology at uh, the Christian Medical College Ludhiana, Dianan Medical College Ludhiana, and there is a national board in nephrology as well in India. Uh, he is a member of the uh, National Academic, uh, Academy of Medical Sciences. He's also done his European specialty examination in nephrology. And that's a fed, that's uh, part of the Federation of the Royal College of Physicians of UK and ERA. Um, and uh, also done the GLOMCON Virtual Glomerular Disease Fellowship in July 22. Uh, he's got a number of publications to his credit. He's got a lot of, uh, a number of uh, prizes and presentations and also has an editorial as well as a chapter in a textbook. Now, without much delay, I go on to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, John. Uh, uh, we also call him Sony as his pet name. Uh, over to you, John. Please take over. Apologies again. Please take over. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, once again, I apologize for the delay. Uh, you're just not able to sort out this uh, technical glitch. Uh, hope I'm audible. Yeah, it's audible. Okay, so uh, today's topic uh, that I've been given to speak on is on hypernatremia, uh, a case-based approach. Uh, what are the implications and what are the various ways of management? Now, uh, among all the electrolyte disorders that we see day in and day out, uh, hypernatremia is something which is, I feel, is something which is usually neglected. Uh, hyponatremia is very common. We see it day in and day out. We are, all of us are well versed with its uh, way of management. Uh, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia we do see. And hypercalcemia also we do see. But when it comes to hyponatremia, most of us are, are, uh, uh, are not very sure of how to manage it. And most of us are not very confident of uh, how to approaching it. So this is one topic which I thought I should uh, emphasize on. Uh, can I, can I, uh, how do I move the next slide? Yeah. Okay, so my outline of, uh, uh, I actually, I, I've been able to log in through my computer. Yeah, then go ahead. Yeah. Then I'll just go ahead. Can, one second. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, once again, apology, apology for all these problems. Okay. So in my outline of discussion, I would like to first talk about what are the various uh, etiologies of hyponatremia. Can we move forward? What is the pathophysiology? What are the clinical features? How do how to etiologically approach a case of hypernatremia? And what are the various ways of managing hypernatremia? And a brief word on outcomes and a few interesting cases. So what is hypernatremia? Is hypernatremia a serum sodium more than 145? Now what we need to understand here is what is the difference between tonicity and osmolality. Now, tonicity is nothing but it is the electrolytes in the circulation which contributes to the plasma tonicity. So that is mainly sodium and to some extent potassium. Whereas osmolality is determined via, by electrolytes as well as by glucose and urea. So for example, we all know that treatment of choice for hypernatremia is 5% dextrose. Now 5% dextrose is, a, is highly osmolic but it has a very low tonicity and thus it can be used as a fluid of choice for treatment of hypernatremia. So now coming to when we, when we need to understand about the, which are the electrolytes which contributes to tonicity, what we need to understand is the concept of total body water. Next slide. Yeah, so total body water is nothing but it is the percentage. Now, how when we calculate the total body water, what we normally say is 60% of the body weight. 
but ideally when you say you need to be more specific uh, in males who are young less than 60 years of age it contributes to 60 percentage of body weight whereas in females it is around 50 percentage of body weight and for elderly we have to reduce it by around 10 percentage when we talk about hyperatremia we need to minus 10 percentage from the body weight so for example if it's a 50 year old male uh, in whom you are managing hyponatremia, if you the first thing what you need to determine is the total body water. So total body water in a young male is 60 percentage. So it is 60 percentage of the body weight. Yeah. And when you're dealing with hyponatremia, you have to minus 10 percentage. So it becomes 50 percentage of body weight. Now if you look at the total body water, it is composed of intracellular fluid, which is the major part, 40 percentage, and extracellular fluid, which is around 20 percentage. And the main electrolyte which, which determines the tonicity in the plasma is sodium, whereas the main uh, electrolyte within the cell is your potassium. And this balance is maintained by a sodium potassium ATP. Next slide. So now what are the factors which determine your hypernatremia? So when you look at the plasma sodium, the plasma sodium is determined by a formula that is total body sodium plus total body potassium upon the total body water. So what are the factors which thus can increase your plasma sodium? The most important factor is the total body water. So when there is a decrease in your total body water, that is dehydration, that is the most common cause of hyponatremia. The other causes are increase in your so sodium intake, that is a sodium load, or increase in your potassium intake. Now how can potassium intake increase your plasma sodium? So when there is an increase in your potassium intake, what will happen is this potassium is, has to be pumped intracellularly. And this movement of potassium intracellularly by the sodium potassium base is associated by sodium moving out. Now, what are the factors? Now, our body has been, uh, has been uh, created in such a way that we have certain protective factors which prevent, which help from prevention of hyponatremia. And these two factors are one is thirst, and second is ADH secretion. Now, what stimulates thirst and ADH secretion is the increase in osmolality. So, when as the osmolality increases, the normal body osmolality is between 275 to 295. So, as the osmolality increases beyond 295, the first thing that gets activated is your is your ADH. Now, what does the ADH do? The ADH that is vasopressin it binds to the B2 receptor, which is present on the vasolateral membrane of your T cells of your collecting duct. And that leads to increase in your adenyl cyclase activity. That results in increased production of protein kinase A. And this protein kinase A leads to aquaporin 2 channels insertion on the apical membrane. So this leads to increased water absorption. So the first protective mechanism that our body has is increase in your ADH secretion, which increases the water intake and brings down the sodium. The second thing, as the osmolality further increases, the next mechanism is your thirst. So the thirst is a very important mechanism which helps in prevention of hyponatremia. So next slide. So now what, what we need to understand is the concept of hypovolemia and dehydration. Many a times we think these are synonymous terms, but they are not actually synonymous. So what is dehydration? Dehydration is nothing but loss of electrolyte free water okay whereas hypovolemia is when you lose water as well as as salt so dehydration is mainly seen in which conditions when you excessively sweat or when you lose water through your kidney that is diabetes insipidus or osmotic diuresis or in cases of osmotic diarrhea osmotic diarrhea is with with administration of lactulose whereas hypovolemia you get when you do diuretics or with secretory diarrhea. Now, what are the electrolyte abnormality that you get in dehydration? In dehydration, you lose water, but not electrolytes. So you develop hyponatremia in dehydration, whereas you develop hyponatremia with hypovolemia. So to understand this concept, what we need to understand is, what is the normal electrolyte concentration of various fluids? So when, if you look at the total plasma, sodium plus potassium, it is roughly around 140 to 150. Now, if you look at your sweat, what is sweat? Sweat is nothing but it is, it is an electrolyte-free water wherein the sodium has been removed out by the sweat gland. So if you look at the electrolyte concentration of sweat, it is, it is an electrolyte-free concentration. It's around 50 to 
55. So when you, in situations like burns or heat stroke, when you lose a lot of sweat, what you develop is actually a hyponatremia. If you look at the gastric fluid, gastric fluid is also actually electrolyte work. So if you look at the total plasma, sodium plus potassium in gastric fluid, it's around 50 to 55. So in conditions like vomiting and nasogastric drainage, again, you develop hyponatremia. And because of loss of acid, you will develop metabolic alkalosis. Now coming to diarrhea, diarrhea is of two types. One is secretory diarrhea and second is an osmotic diarrhea. Secretory diarrhea is what you get in cholera and in biopoma. Biopoma is nothing but it's a neuroendocrine tumor which secretes your, uh, which secretes a, a hormone called as BIP. Now in this condition, what happens is the, the fluid that is secreted is, is the plasma, is, is equivalent to plasma. In, so in, in secretory diarrhea, what you get is hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and because you lose bicarbonates, you develop normal anion gap metabolic acidosis with a negative urine anion gap. Whereas osmotic diarrhea is seen in, with a lactulose or sorbitol administration, and in certain conditions, certain viral and bacterial gastroenteritis. Again, in osmotic diarrhea, the fluid electrolyte concentration is electrolyte free. So here again, what you develop is hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and because of volume depletion, you develop metabolic alkalosis. So this is how the, the pathogenesis of each of these diseases can present with either hyper or hyponatremia. So what are the clinical features of hyponatremia? The first thing what I said is, as the sodium level increases, osmolality increases, and you get an intense thirst. But this thirst actually protects from hyponatremia. There are three situations wherein this thirst may be absent. So that's a very dangerous thing to happen. One, it's seen in a lot of our geriatric patients. Secondly, that is why we get a lot of consults from the geriatric ward with hyponatremia. The second thing is a situation called as primary hypodipsia, wherein there is an absence of your thirst uh, regulation. And third situation is something called as erdipsic diabetes insipidus, which I'll come to uh, in the uh, next slide. It is nothing but a central diabetes insipidus with loss of your thirst. With further increase in your hyponatremia and with volume loss, what you develop is signs of. So initial stage is a stage of dehydration. The next stage is a stage of hypovolemia when you develop orthostatic hypotension and tachycardia. And the last stage is when you start developing neurological manifestation. So in a neurological manifestation, we have the first stage. So you have the first stage that is called as an initial stage. In the initial stage, what happens is there is increase in your sodium. And as the sodium becomes more than 158, what will happen? There is increased osmolality. So there is movement of water from the brain cell into the uh, plasma. So what will happen is you get shrinkage of your brain cells. So this brain shrinkage will produce symptoms like confusion, coma, and in late stages, it may produce seizures. So the, the, the degree of your neurological symptoms is equivalent to the, the degree of your severity of your hyponatremia. So in very severe stages, when you have a sudden acute rise in hyponatremia, there are certain situations, most of the cases of hyponatremia are chronic, that is, it develops over 48 hours. There are a few situations wherein you develop an acute hyponatremia. In these situations, the sudden increase in osmolality results in something called as osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is the same thing what we get when we rapidly correct hyponatremia. Now, once this initial stage gets passed, the next stage is a stage of adaptation. So, what does the brain do? The brain knows now there is there are there is there is higher osmolality outside the cells. So, what it does is tries to accumulate electrolytes. So, that is the early, that is a rapid adaptation. So this accumulation of electrolytes within the brain cell increases the osmolality within the brain cell and prevents further water loss from the brain cell. Then there is a stage of slow adaptation wherein the brain starts accumulating some organic osmolytes as well as it moves out fluid from the CSF. In this way, again, what does it do? It tries to decrease the uh, uh, water movement from the brain cells into the extracellular cells. So that is a stage of adaptation. Then comes a stage of correction. Now, when you see hyponatremia, you start treating the hyponatremia. Now, if you give a proper correction, what will happen? A proper therapy, a slow therapy will result in correction of the hyponatremia and return of the brain cells to normal size. But if you rapidly correct your hyponatremia, then what will happen? Like this is more common in children. So when you rapidly correct your hyponatremia, what will happen is now 
now now the 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 outside the, the extra cellular osmolality will suddenly drop and the brain osmolality is is increased because of the adapt, adaptation that has happened and water starts moving into the cells and you develop something called as cerebral edema so that is a stage of uh, stage of rapid correction can cause uh, cerebral edema so what you understand from here is initial stage when you when there is an acute hyponatremia there is a risk of cerebral shrinkage that is osmotic demyelination syndrome and if you rapidly correct hyponatremia what you develop is a cerebral edema which can occur more commonly in children so now what are the causes of hyponatremia so when we think of hyponatremia we divide it into three things the first thing is and the most common cause is loss of your uh, loss of your electrolyte free water the second cause is your excess of your sodium intake and the third situation is there are certain predisposing factors which can cause hyponatremia so when you look at the loss of electrolyte free water uh, as i said when we uh, the, the previous slide when we when we spoke about the pathogenesis of hyponatremia one it can lose we can lose electrolyte free water through the skin we can lose it through the git through the gut and we can lose it through the kidney and there is a rare situation where it water may enter into the cells now insensible losses through skin can occur because of burns fever or heat stroke and in neonates who are inadequately breastfed gi loss can be upper gi lower gi upper gi is because of vomiting and nasogastric drainage and lower gi that is diarrhea it is not the secretory diarrhea but it's the osmotic diarrhea which can cause hyponatremia renal losses of water can be divided into two groups osmotic diuresis and water diuresis water diuresis is nothing but diabetes insipidus which can be central or nephrogenic whereas osmotic diuresis is because of increased water loss because of an osmotically active agent within the tubule that can be either glucose urea or mannitol glucose can be because of uncontrolled diabetes or a new group of sglt2 inhibitors urea can be because of a, a recovery phase of atn or because of post obstructive diuresis then comes the stage wherein there is entry of water into the cells now this this occurs in certain situations like severe exercise seizures or electrical shock now why does water enter into the cells here so in in these situations like a seizure or an electric shock the uh, the, the intracellular solutes are broken down into smaller solutes and this results in increase in intracellular osmolality and this results in movement of water from extracellular to intracellular uh, cells and as a result you develop hyponatremia the next cause is because there are certain predisposing factors for hyponatremia the predisposing factors of hyponatremia as i said the the biggest factor which prevents hyponatremia is thirst so if you have an impaired access to water like neonates or geriatric patients who are bedridden or ventilated patient in icu that's why a lot of icu consults come with hyponatremia uh, because of positive sodium balance and in post operative patients when they are sedated the other thing is when you don't have thirst because of a hypothalamic disorder that i said earlier that is primary hypodipsia and ergodipsic diabetes insipidus and in a rare situation primary hyperaldosteronism can lead to a resetting of your thirst osmostat and as a result you may develop a hyponatremia now coming to what is diabetes insipidus now diabetes insipidus is a situation where you have polyuria what is polyuria polyuria is urine output more than 3 liters per day or more than 40 ml per kg per day now in this situation if you look at the urine osmolality the urine osmolality will be low okay so normally what happens normally when there is hyponatremia the, the there is increase in your plasma osmolality that stimulates your adh hormone the adh hormone acts on the v2 receptor leads to water absorption to aquaporin channels and as a result there will be increased water excretion and your urine osmolality and water reabsorption and as a result your urine osmolality should be more than 600 so in hyponatremia your urine osmolality a normal response would be it should be more than 600 whereas in diabetes insipidus because of either a deficiency of adh or because of a defect in action of adh your water absorption doesn't occur and as a result in spite of hyponatremia your urine osmolality will be less than 300 another thing that you can use for calculation is something called as a total daily osmolar output now this total daily osmolar output is a very simple thing uh, it is nothing but it's a urine osmolality multiplied by your 24 hour urine volume so if the total daily osmolar output is less than 900 again it's a pointer towards diabetes insipidus now 
uh, th then how do you confirm its diabetes insipidus? What you do is something called as water deprivation test. Now, why do you do a do water deprivation test? In water deprivation test, what, what is the aim is you try to increase the sodium to more than 145 and plasma osmolarity to more than 295. That is the aim of water deprivation test. At this level, the ADH is acting the maximum. So in spite of water deprivation, if your urine osmolality is less than 700, then you confirm that it's a case of diabetes insipidus. So once you have confirmed it's diabetes insipidus, then you have to do, you have to differentiate whether it's central or nephrogenic. So what you do is you administer desmopressin and again measure the urine os osmolality. If the urine osmolality improves to more than 700, that means it's a deficiency. So it's a central DI. If the urine osmolality remains less than 700, it's an exogenic DI. So what are the causes of your central DI? So central DI is can be because of multiple causes. It can be because of congenital causes. There's a syndrome called as Wolfram syndrome wherein you get diabetes insipidus plus diabetes mellitus plus optic atrophy plus deafness. It can be because of neurosurgical trauma. So we get a couple of consults usually from post-surgical patients from the neuro ICU with hypernatremia. Or it can be because of an infiltrative disease like neurosarcoidosis or Langerhans and histocytosis. Rarely in patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and patients with post-SVT and even in patients with anorexia nervosa you can have a central diabetes insipidus. What are the causes of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Nephrogenic diabetic insipidus can be inherited. So as I as, as we discussed the, the, the action of ADH, the, either the, there can be a defect in the basolateral V2 receptor, which is X-linked, or there can be a defect in the apical uh, equoporin 2 channel, which is autosomal. There are certain electrolyte disorders which can cause nephrogenic DI, that is hypokalemia and hypercalcemia. There are a couple of drugs which can cause DI, of which when I was doing my MD, at that time lithium was being used a lot. So a lot of patients with lithium toxicity used to present with DI. Now uh, there are better antipsychotics, so less commonly we encounter uh, uh, DI secondary to lithium. Then there are a lot of chemotherapeutic drugs like ifosfamide, for example, which can cause DI. Even simple drugs which we use day to day, like your doxycycline, ofloxacin can also cause DI. Uh, a couple of antivirals can cause DI. Amphotericin B. So amphotericin B uh, uh, can cause a multiple of multiple abnormalities. It can cause uh, a, a non-oliguric API. It can cause hypokalemia. It can cause hypomagnesemia and renal tubular acidosis. And rarely it can also present with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Tolvaptan, which is used to treat hyponatremia, acts by blocking the V2 receptor. So that actually, what does it do? It's a hydrogenic diabetes insipidus that is created. Weight reduction drug orally stat can also cause diabetes insipidus. Now, tubular interstitial diseases and certain infiltrative diseases like amyloidosis are also rare causes of nephrogenic DI. Now, I spoke about something called as erdipsic diabetes insipidus. This is nothing but a person with a central DI. Central DI means there's a deficiency of ADH plus there is an impaired thirst. So this is a very deadly combination because such patients they don't, they don't feel thirsty and they, they never, they, therefore, when you develop hypernatremia, there are no symptoms of hypernatremia. So such patients develop recurrent hypernatremia and as a result of this, they can develop osmotic demyelination syndrome. How do you treat? It's very difficult to treat such patients. First thing you have to give desmopressin because there's an ADH deficiency. Now, since there is no thirst, how will you advise the patient to take water? How much water the patient should take? So what you need to do is you have to monitor these patients regularly and find out at what body weight you, uh, the patient's sodium is within a normal limit. Then, then based on the body weight, you have to advise water intake. For example, if the body weight decreases by 0.5 percentage, 0.5 kg, then you have to take 500 ml of water extra. And if there's a deviation in body weight by more than 3 percentage, then you have to monitor the serum sodium. So this is a rare cause of uh, recurrent hypernatremia. Now, we spoke about all the conditions wherein you can have hypernatremia because of decrease, because of loss of your electrolyte-free water. Now, the second entity is a little rare condition wherein you get hypernatremia because of excess sodium intake. Now, this can occur in acute salt poisoning. So, this is a very interesting thing. In Turkey, the newborn babies are, are uh, uh, what, what, on, days, on second or third day of their, uh, of their birth, 
the newborn babies undergo a a kind of a procedure called as salting it's a ritual that they do wherein they put these babies newborn babies into a, a, a tumbler containing no, a, a high concentration of salt now what is the aim of this salting they say that with the salting uh, they prevent baby from having bad odors and and that also uh, the skin becomes a uh, more uh, protective against infection so that is the purpose of this whole ritual but what happens is the baby skin newborn skin is very porous and the salt gets absorbed into the systemic circulation and babies can develop hyponatremia so this is one rare cause of acute salt poisoning and sometimes ingestion of sea water sea water drowning can result in hyponatremia and what we see is hydrogenic hyponatremia because of inadvertent administration of hypotonic saline sodium bicarbonate infusion for correction of acidosis or hypotonic saline enemas Uh, and in ICU patients, positive sodium balance because of excess of sodium administration. So most of the times, when you have when you see a patient of hyponatremia, the etiology is quite obvious. Like for example, you may have a patient with a osmotic diarrhea who comes with hyponatremia. Then what you have to do is stop the uh, the, the 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 osmotic agent, stop the lactulose or sorbitol whatever is taking, and then you administer the fluids. So, or you may see in ICU a patient given uh, 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 sodium bicarbonate infusion, and on day two the patient develops hyponatremia. Then you have to stop the sodium bicarbonate in vitro box. Most of the times, so the etiology, unlike hyponatremia, hyponatremia your etiology is quite easy. But what happens is sometimes you may not a patient with multiple comorbidities in ICU. It might be becomes very difficult to find to pinpoint what is the cause of hyponatremia. So this is a very simple way. of reaching to the etiological diagnosis so now this approach is based on a very simple principle what happens normally normally when there is hyponatremia your osmolality increases your adh gets secreted this adh causes water absorption and your urine osmolality should be more than 600 so what you do is when you see a case of hyponatremia and you're not sure what is the etiology a simple thing what you need to do is just collect a urine sample and send it for urine osmolality if the urine osmolality is more than 600 it is because of extra renal water loss or rarely it can be because of sodium overload and this you can differentiate by doing a urine spot sodium and a fraction excretion of sodium so if it's a sodium overload your fraction excretion will be more than 2 percentage and your urine spot sodium will be more than 100 Whereas, if it's because of extra renal water loss, there will be more sodium absorption, so your urine spot sodium will be less than 25, or your fraction excretion will be less than 0.1 percentage. If your urine osmolality is less than 300, as I said earlier, it is diagnostic of diabetes insipidus. So, what you what you have to know here is maybe either central or nephrogenic. You do a water deprivation test. In spite of water deprivation test, if the urine osmolality is still less than 300. then you can confirm your diagnosis of di then you do a uh, you give desmopressin and check the urine osmolality if it improves then it's central di if it doesn't improve it's a nephrogenic di so this is how you differentiate now there are few cases which may be in between that is the urine osmolality between 300 to 600 this may be either because of diabetes insipidus a partial diabetes insipidus or it might be because of osmotic diuresis so what you do here is you measure the total daily osmolar output which is nothing but you calculate the 24 urine volume multiply the urine osmolality with that if that is more than 1000 then it might be because of osmotic diuresis which may be because of a recovery of an atn or it may be because of uh, glucose if it's less than 900 then it is diabetes insipidus so this is a very simple way to pinpoint what might be the cause of hyponatremia another thing what we need to know is so first thing you look at okay hyponatremia is present what is the cause of hyponatremia the second thing what you have to look at is is it an acute or chronic hyponatremia 95 to 96 percent 95 to 99 percent of cases what we encounter day to day practice is a chronic hyponatremia wherein the the duration is of more than 48 hours so what are the cases wherein you may develop you may see an acute hyponatremia one is salt poisoning which is un, 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 uncommon in our uh, in most uh, in most places second is patients with diabetes insipidus undergoing surgery without adequate water replacement so that some patients with partial di they may be asymptomatic 
and when they undergo a uh, some routine surgery and are not well adequately given water replacement these patients may develop an acute hypernatremia post post uh, surgical uh, in the post recovery room third condition what we may see is when you are correcting your hyperglycemia so in cases of diabetic ketoacidosis or in cases of um, that is hyper uh, uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non ketotic states so in these states when you when you treat hyperglycemia you may develop hy acute hypernatremia the why it's important to differentiate because the the target of therapy is different now in case of in case of chronic hypernatremia what you want to do is you want to reduce the sodium only by 10 to 12 millimol per liter within 24 hours why because if you do a rapid correction you may end up with cerebral edema whereas in acute hypernatremia you need to attain a normal sodium level that means you need to attain a sodium level of 145 within 24 hours why if you don't attain a rapid sodium level rapid normal sodium level you may end up developing a osmotic demyelination syndrome so that is why you should know what type of hypernatremia that you are dealing with now what are the fluids that you can give for hypernatremia now the fluid of choice is 5% dextrose why 5% dextrose because the 5% dextrose contains no sodium now which are the other fluids that you can give you can give a half normal saline that is 0.45 percentage normal saline that contains 77 millimoles of sodium and uh, in some places in india we we don't has one quarter normal saline which contains even lower amount of infusate sodium can we give normal saline for treatment of hypernatremia no normal saline should not be given because it contains 154 millimoles of sodium it is used only in patients with hypernatremia with severe hypovolemia leading to volume resuscitation so now coming to management of hypernatremia okay now coming to management of hypernatremia uh Uh, the first thing what we need to do is we have to treat the cause of your hypernatremia now now what can be the cause of hypernatremia if it's a central di you give a adh if it's a nephrogenic di like for example lithium induced di you block the epithelial sodium channel by using amiloride or in case of a uh, hydrogenic agent like sodium bicarbonate you withhold the agent or if it's a diarrhea you treat the diarrhea the next yes. important the next important thing is to uh, reduce the serum sodium level now reduction of serum sodium level is basically giving 5% dextrose now there are various formulas various methods in which we can reduce the serum sodium level now when i was doing my mbbs at that time the first question when we used to see hypernatremia cases in ward would be what is the water deficit equation what is your water deficit in this patient then as i when i joined my uh, post graduation then my seniors used to ask me what is the what if you give 1 liter of 5% dextrose how much will the sodium come down so that is your adrog madias formula but now over the years what we have learned is all these formulas have their flaws and what we need is a more practical approach which is what we follow nowadays so when we go to the water deficit equation now what what is the water deficit water deficit is nothing but your total body water multiplied by the serum sodium of the patient minus 140 divided by 40, 140 so that is your water deficit now uh now what what is the purpose of this water deficit now what you need to understand is uh when you have hyper acute and chronic hypernatremia what should be the target now the problem with the water deficit equation is it's well it's good to know like for example if a patient has a sodium of 160 and he has a body weight of 50 uh, 50 kg then as i said earlier based on the percentage of body weight that is 60 percentage of body weight will be the total body water you minus 169 minus 140 divided by 140 you will get some amount like let's say 5 liters that means you have to administer 5 liters to correct the hypernatremia but the problem with water deficit equation is that although you may take all efforts in calculating the water deficit you finally do not you don't end up giving that you don't end up correcting that water deficit why because majority of cases that we see in day to day practice is chronic hypernatremia and in chronic hypernatremia what we want is not to correct the sodium within 24 hours what we need to do is a target fall of only 10 millimoles in 24 hours so then what is the use of water deficit the water deficit will be useful only in acute 
hypernatremia. In acute hypernatremia, the entire deficit, let's say six liters, has to be given over 24 hours. And so what will be the hourly infusion? You divide the water deficit by 24. So if it is six liters or 6,000 6, ml, you divide 6,000 by 24, that many ml per hour would be the rate of infusion. Whereas in chronic hypernatremia, we use a simple principle. If you administer 3 ml per kg of electrolyte free water, that will reduce the sodium by 1 millimole per liter. So, so that means if you give 3 ml per kg of electrolyte free water, that is 5% dextrose, it will reduce your sodium by 1. What we, what we want, we want the sodium to reduce by 10 over 1 day. So the, the total amount of water, uh, the fluid that should be administered would be 3 ml per kg into 10. And what will be the hourly infusion? You divide that by 24. So this is how we use the water uh, deficit equation. Now, along with this, what, what we also need to take into account is the obligatory losses. So when we, as and when we are correcting hypernatremia, they may be obligatory losses through your sweat and through your stool. That is roughly around 30 to 40 ml per hour. And in diabetes insipidus, you need to also calculate something called as effective free water clearance. That is to calculate for the free water loss. Now to understand this, let's take a simple case. We have a 76 year old man who presented with severe obtendation, dry mucous membrane, decreased skin turgor, tachypnea, and a blood pressure of 120 by 70. Now uh, he had orthostatic changes and he gives history of lactulose abuse with multiple episodes of loose motions over five days. Now the serum sodium is now 168 and his body weight is 68. So we have an elderly gentleman who has come with hypernatremia. What is the cause over here? The cause is clear cut. So we don't need to follow that urine osmolality. It's because of an osmotic diarrhea. So what we do is we stop the lactulose. Next step, what we do is we estimate the total body water. What is total body water? Uh, total body water? As I said, it should be 60 percentage of body weight, but in an elderly male, it will be 50 percentage of body weight. And in a hypernatremia, we again minus 10 percentage for the uh, dehydration. So it will become 40 percentage of his body weight. So 40 percentage of 68 would be 27 liters. So his, his estimated total body water is 27 liters. Now, what is the water deficit? Water deficit is total body water into the serum sodium that is 27 into 168 minus 140 upon your 140. Now that comes up to 4.5 liters. But what is the type of hypernatremia? Now he gives history of five days of loose motion. So it's a chronic hypernatremia, more than 48 hours. So what should be, should we replace the full 4.5 4 liters? No. So what we should do is we should only target a fall of 10 millimole for 24 hours. Now from our knowledge, we know that 3 ml per kg of water uh, uh, can reduce sodium by 1. So what we do is we give 3 ml per kg. That is 3 into 68 into 10. So what, what is the replacement that has to be given? It is 2.4 liters. So now here is the flaw. In spite of calculating the water deficit, we are not replacing the water deficit. We are only replacing almost half of the water deficit. Now the next thing what you look at is the obligatory losses that comes to around 30 to 40 ml per hour. So that would be 40 into 24. That would be 960 ml in 24 hours, so roughly one liter. So the desired water replacement would be 2.4 plus 1. That would be 3.4 liters. And if you want to see hourly infusion, you divide by 24. That will come up to 150 ml per hour. So this is how we use water deficit equation to calculate our fluid replacement. The next thing is your Edrov Madias formula, which is nothing but it's a very it's more simplified. Here, what we look at is we can we try to find out if we give one liter of five percent dextrose, what will be the change in sodium? That is given by a formula that is infusate sodium, that is uh, in, in infusate sodium minus patient serum sodium upon total body water plus one. So infusate sodium in five percent dextrose is zero. There is no sodium in five percent dextrose. Now let's go to the next, the same case. Next slide. So the same 76 year old gentleman who has hypernatremia because of osmotic diarrhea. Now, what is his estimated body water? We said it's 40 percentage of his body weight. So 27 liters. Now we use the Edrog Madias formula. If I give five, one liter of 5% dextrose, what will be the change in your sodium? 
So that is infusate sodium that is zero minus patient sodium that is 168 divided by total body water that is 27 plus one. So that comes as six. So what does it mean? It means that if I give one liter of 5% dextrose, his sodium will drop by six millimoles. Now, what is the hypernatremia? This is a chronic hypernatremia. What is my target? I want the sodium to reduce by 10. So if I give one liter, sodium will reduce by six. So how much should I give to reduce the sodium by 10? So that would be 10 by six. That would come up to 1.6 liters. We have to add to that, uh, to the obligatory water losses, which is around 40 ml per hour, which comes up to one liter. So that would be total would be 1.6 plus one. So it comes to 2.6 and you divide it by 24, that will give your hourly infusion rate, which comes up to 120 ml per hour. So now by using the water deficit equation, what did we get? We get around 150 ml per hour. By using the adrog Madias formula for the same case, we get around 120 ml per hour. So now what is the problem here? The problem here is the formulas and the time and the amount of effort that we need to do. So what happens mostly is you see a patient in an ICU setting, patient is ventilated, patient is bedridden, you do not know what is the actual body weight and to calculate the lean body weight from an unknown body weight is even more difficult and then you have certain formulas which you need to really put your head on and final end result of it is that the, the volume, the, the rate of volume administration is no much different. So what we now follow is something called as a very simple method that is a practical approach for hypernatremia. So what we do here is it's a very simple logic that you use. Now we know that in, if you give 3 ml per kg per hour, the sodium will drop by 1. So if you want to reduce the sodium by increase, uh, you want the sodium to drop by around 10 millimole, then what you do is you administer it at, at a rate of 1.5 or less than 1.5. So roughly 1.35 ml per kg per hour. So if you give 3 ml per kg per hour, the sodium will decrease by 24 in over 24 hours. So you want it to be around 10 to 12. So you, you half the rate. So it comes to 1.37, 1.35 ml per kg per hour. That will reduce, that will reduce the sodium by 10 millimole. Whereas in acute hypernatremia, you give at a rate of 3 to 6 ml per kg per hour till the sodium reaches 145. And then you reduce it at 1 ml per kg per hour till the sodium reaches 140. Now, this is what you do in a very simple practical state. So now let's go to the same uh, case. So you have the same elderly gentleman who has got an osmotic diarrhea and hyponatremia. Let's use this simple equation. We know it's a chronic hyponatremia because the duration is more than 48 hours. The target fall of sodium in 24 hours is 10. We know that if you give 3 ml per kg per hour, it will reduce by 24. So we make it to 1.35 ml per kg per hour. So his body weight is 68. So if it is 1.35 ml per kg per hour, you need to administer at 100 ml per hour. Now the obligatory losses are around 40 ml per hour. So what you do is you infuse at roughly 140 to 150 ml per hour and you monitor the sodium every six hourly and the rate or at which the sodium should drop would be 0.5 millimole per liter per hour. So without any formula, we ended up giving the same amount of fluid as what we would have given using the formula. So this is a simple practical approach for management of hypernatremia. So in acute hypernatremia, you administer at three to six ml per kg per hour till you attain a normal sodium and then one ml per kg per hour. Whereas in, in chronic hypernatremia, you give 5% dextrose at a rate of 1.35 ml per kg per hour at a maximum rate of 150 ml per hour. Now, there are certain situations wherein this 5% dextrose may not be tolerated. That means you may develop, you may, you can develop hyperglycemia. So which are the patients who may develop hyperglycemia with 5% dextrose? So one is patients with underlying diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, physiologically stressed individuals like in ICU settings because of uh, increased secretion of stress hormones like glucocorticoids and, and uh, epinephrine. And when you need a rapid correction, as in acute hypernatremia, wherein you're giving large volumes of 5% dextrose, you may develop hyperglycemia. Now, the maximum rate of at which glucose metabolism occurs in a normal individual is 10 milligram per kg per minute. And this limit in a normal individual is attained at 600 ml per hour. So what do we do? In such individuals who are more likely to develop hypernatremia, 
what we can do is we can give half normal saline that is 0.45 normal saline now uh, now what should be the rate at which you can give 0.45 normal saline so it's almost at double the rate so if you want to give at 3 ml per kg per hour you will have to give at 6 ml per kg per hour so now in the same case if the if this patient was a diabetic and has having high sugars and we are unable to give 5% dextrose instead of giving at 1.5 1.35 ml per kg per hour we will have to give 3 ml per kg per hour of 0.45 percentage normal saline now what is why we take all these efforts of treating hypernatremia this is because of various studies which are shown a poor outcomes of hypernatremia so in this paper which came out in april of this year in kidney 360 what they found is that in hospital mortality of patients with hypernatremia was significantly higher than patients with normo uh, normo natremia with an odds of mortality of almost 34 to 21 times higher the next the another study from in dmc 2014 it looked at 85 cases of hypernatremia that were admitted in ed and they found that in 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 almost 45% cases the the fluid that was administered was wrong that is patients in whom the the blood pressure was on the lower side they received uh, uh, hypotonic fluids and in patients in whom blood pressure was on a higher side they received normal saline so almost 40 percentage patients had a wrong rate of rate, wrong fluid that was administered and the in, in the mortality rate was almost 25 percentage in another study that was published in uh, in 2011 they looked at 131 hospitalized patients with hypernatremia and they found that at 72 hours almost when uh, the hypernatremia was corrected in only 27 percentage of patients that means inadequate therapy was given and the 30 day mortality was as high as 37 percentage so all these things end up in one thing now are we under correcting hypernatremia or are are we really bothered about the over correction of hypernatremia so now in, so the problem here is that we always try to correlate our findings of hypernatremia with hyponatremia which is not right so if you look at all the old studies which showed that over correction can cause cerebral edema these were all pediatric series so yes in children over correction is a big problem so in children if you over correct the hypernatremia that means if you give correction more than 12 millimole per day that will result in cerebral edema or rehydration seizures so that is a problem in your pediatric population but whereas in an adult population the problem is under correction so if you under correct that means if the rate of correction of hypernatremia is less than 0.25 millimole per liter per hour or if the hypernatremia is not corrected within 72 hours elderly patients especially have a high mortality so the problem with hypernatremia in adult in the population that we usually see is under correction before i end i just i want to just discuss two two interesting cases which we had seen this is a 66 year old male who is a diabetic hypertensive with chronic atrial fibrillation presented to cardiology department with a st elevated mi underwent a percutaneous intervention to left coronary artery post percutaneous uh, post uh, pci he was post coronary intervention he was initiated on a couple of medicines he was put on arbs he was put on di uh, 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 in uh, diuretics hydrolyzing uh, anti anginal drugs in and anti diabetics that included insulin metformin sglt2 inhibitor uh, dual antiplatelets and uh, and statins now he was doing well on day 5 he developed a stroke he developed a left hemiplegia that was attributed to a right mca infarct and then the patient was treat, uh, was uh, in the hospital and he was improving actually neurologically uh, over the next 10 days but on day 15 suddenly his sensorium dropped on examination he looked very dry his skin turgor was poor he had hypotension and he had a creatinine of 1.4 and a sodium of 160 and and nephrology was called for this uh, nephrology consult was said so as a nephrologist we always looked at the intake output so we, we looked at the charts and what did we find was the patient over the last 3 days had a intake of less than 2 liters and output was more than 3 liters so one thing was clear the patient is having polyuria so the first thing that we saw was yes now the output is more than 3 liters so patient is having polyuria the next thing what we did we didn't know what now in this situation we were not sure what is the cause of the hyponatremia so we did a urine osmolality the urine osmolality was 650 so as i said earlier 
if the urinary osmolality is more than 600 it means it it means it is more likely to be a, a, a either a, a extra renal water loss or because of uh, loss of your or because of sodium gain so then what we did was we calculated the total daily osmolar output now total daily osmolar output is nothing but you multiply the urine osmolality with this uh, urine volume which is around 4.3 liters and that came out to be more than 1000 so then we came to know that okay this is a case of osmotic diuresis and then what we did was we looked at the urine routine now urine routine showed glucose 4 plus patient however didn't have hyperglycemia so it was a u glycemic glycosuria that the patient had so when you have a u glycemic glycosuria your first the first thing that comes into your mind is is it a fanconi syndrome but when you looked at the abg it was a metabolic alkalosis there was no acidosis present there was no hypokalemia there was no hypouricemia or hypophosphatemia so nothing no features of fanconi syndrome so what did what was this this was nothing but this was a dapagliflozin induced that is a stlt2 induced osmotic diuresis which caused the hyponatremia so in this case we stopped the stlt2 inhibitor and gave him fluids and on day 3 his sensorium improved and his sodium normalized so next is a patient uh, in ed a 60 year old male who came with a cardiac arrest he he received 10 ampules of sodium bicarbonate and uh, 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 and he uh, and he, uh, uh, resuscitation was given he was revived but when after re uh, revival he was sent to an icu where he was tuberous and he was on a mechanical ventilator his blood pressure was 130 by 86 he had a lot of edema on examination and his serum sodium was 165 but his urine output is only 20 ml per hour so what is this hyponatremia this hyponatremia is a acute hyponatremia secondary to sodium bicarbonate so in acute hyponatremia as i said earlier what we what should we do we should give a fluid at 3 to 6 ml per kg per hour but can we give it over here no why because the patient is fluid overloaded he would require around 500 ml per hour which he will not tolerate then can we give last six infusion or furosemide infusion no that will not work over here because diuretics will cause only half will cause diuresis equivalent to half isotonic saline so it will actually end up aggravating your hyponatremia so what what is the only option here so this is an indication for dialysis so when do we dialyze in a case of hyponatremia patients with severe hyponatremia with oliguric aki or fluid overload that that is an indication for dialysis with sodium remodeling so on conclusion the most common cause of hyponatremia is the most common cause of hyponatremia is a loss of electrolyte free water and excess sodium the two major defense mechanisms against hyponatremia are stimulation of thirst and ADH secretion cerebral adaptive mechanisms in hyponatremia involves accumulation of electrolytes and organic osmolytes within the brain to prevent ODS now urine osmolality is a very important tool to find out the cause of hyponatremia if it is less than 300 in patients with hyponatremia it is diagnostic of diabetes insipidus IV fluid choice in hyponatremia is 5% dextrose in water the goal of therapy in acute hyponatremia is to attain a normal serum sodium by 24 hours by giving fluid at a rate of uh, by reducing the serum sodium at 1 millimole per hour the goal of therapy in chronic hyponatremia is to reduce the sodium by 10 millimoles in 24 hours so the rate at which the sodium should drop is around 0.5 millimole per hour overcorrection of hyponatremia in children is associated with seizures whereas under correction of hyponatremia in adults is a major cause of increased mortality thank you very much uh... Uh, Sony, it is a wonderful presentation, uh, barring the technical issues, but it was a great presentation. There was a lot, uh, you know, it's very interesting and very clearly put. I mean, the way uh, is just not the formulas that you use, but you can actually, you know, correct without using those formulas. And, and the cases also were very, uh, very interesting. Uh, the SGL2 causing, uh, uh, causing hy hyponatremia and uh, and, and, and the second case as well. So now, um, I think before we delay, uh, I, I, so again, it's pretty late there. Let's ask the audience for any questions that they may have, any questions. Yeah, you can just uh, just put up your hand and ask. So, so uh, just to start off, see, I, I, I had a patient who, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, uh, went into surgery and post-operative, 
uh, he suddenly went into hyponatremia. Uh, that was, uh, you know, and actually uh, the situation was such that he was actually on lithium. And, uh, you know, in a weak state, he's able to compensate for the loss of fluid he has, the nephrogenic DI he has, uh, lithium-induced nephrogenic DI. But when he went into surgery and the anesthesia, uh, he couldn't control. I mean, the, the free water loss was a, a lot. And, and then he went into hyponatrium. That's something we found out later from the history that he was on lithium. And that's how we found out. Yeah. And I think there are two questions. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah. uh, that is why uh, yeah, uh, one yeah. of the important uh, 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 situation where you develop hyponatrium is when your access to water is lost. So that is seen lost. in patients who are in surgery or patients who uh, are on ICU or ventilator or geriatric patients. So when the access is all of all of a sudden loss, uh, uh, yes. you may get hypernatremia. So a lot of cases of hypernatremia have been picked up, uh, diabetes insipidus, especially partial DI, uh, have been picked up yes. actually in the post-op state because uh, that is a situation wherein uh, they get exposed to the uh, lack of water intake. Lack of water intake, yes. So there are two questions. Uh, uh, one is uh, Dr. Mazhar Ali. Thank you for this comprehensive and informative presentation, Professor. Um, may you kindly please explain again how the hyponatremia occurs in seizures and exercise, number one. And what is your view on using tonicity balance in the management of sodium and electrolyte disorders? And finally, can you use tap water as an option for free water uh, where 5% dextrose is contraindicated? So the first question is how... Uh, hyponatremia happens in seizures. So it's very unlikely. We haven't seen any cases, but this is what is uh, written in literature. So in, when the now when there is a when there is a seizure or an electric shock or even a severe exercise, what they say is the cells there are we have osmolites within the cell. So there is a stress in the cell, and these osmolites break down, and this breakdown of osmolites leads to increase in your intracellular osmolality. So this increase in your intracellular osmolality leads to pull of water from the extracellular tissue, from the interstitium. So this water from the interstitium and the plasma moved in, moves into the cell. As a result, what you develop is a relative hyponatremia. So that is how uh, uh, this thing happens. The, the, I think the second question is whether we, whether we can use uh, free water. Yes, we do use it also. So 5%, uh, whether we can use a, a, a plain plain water. So this plain water is used in ICU settings to, via the Riles tube. So what happens is when a patient can, uh, 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 when 5% when, when exposure becomes an issue because of hyperglycemia and you cannot give a lot of 0.45% normal saline, we do give a lot of uh, water intake through the Riles tube or orally in patients. Uh, that can, because the water intake itself can actually bring down the serum sodium level. And I'm not aware of the tonicity balance on how, how can it be used for electrolyte disorders. I will read up and I'll follow up. I'm not aware of it. Any other questions? Anybody else, any other questions? And again, one last question is, uh, uh, oral against IV, uh, uh, what will be the change in sodium when you give oral uh, you know, free water against IV free water? And can you give oral in place of IV? Yeah, so in many cases of mild hypernatremia, uh, when we when we do not admit the patient, we actually ask them to take a lot of oral fluids. Uh, only problem with oral fluid is we don't have, we are not sure by how much the sodium will get corrected. Whereas with IV, we can we can adjust the rate of infusion and we can monitor the sodium and we can adjust the rate at which the sodium locks. For example, uh, uh, this is not, oral definitely should not be used for a severe hyperatremia. Severe hyperatremia in this in the sense something sodium more than one fifty five. Uh, it would not be recommended to plan a oral uh, water replacement because we, 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 we want the target fall should be less than 10 millimoles. But you can use it in a lot of dehydrated patients who developed a mild hyponatremia in the range of 150, 152. We do ask without admission. We ask them to take a lot of oral fluids and then ask them to follow up with a repeat sodium. And most of the times it comes back to normal. What happens if you overcorrect? Now you you you're dropping it excessively. Now if it's like chronic hyponatremia, you're like in it's like in hyponatremia. It is in hyponatremia when you overcorrect the sodium. Uh, yeah, can so you sort of stop it with desmopressin and hold on for some time? Hold it, the or or yeah, would so, you? Yeah. So the problem is we don't have uh, 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 
see the, the thing is about desmopressin, uh, we, we don't use desmopressin actually. So what we do is when we develop a over overcorrection, you only the, the thing what we do is we reduce the rate of infusion of uh, five percent dextrose, or we stop the uh, infusion of five percent dextrose. But unlike hyponatremia, this problem we are always worried about overcorrection because of hyponatremia, because of our because of our experience with hyponatremia, we are always worried about overcorrection in hyponatremia. But that actually is not the it's not the state. The reason why because Many a times when, when we correct the hyperatremia, we don't take into account the ongoing water losses. So actually okay. we end up actually with an under correction. But I think okay. the best option would be in overcorrection is to stop the infusion and wait and watch. With, with overcorrection, is there cerebral damage that occurs like uh, osmo or uh, osmotic demyelinating? So overcorrection in children is an issue because all the studies which were, which looked at cerebral edema or rehydration seizure. So what happens when you overcorrect? Suddenly the plasma osmolality will drop and that will result in movement of fluid from the outside the cells into the brain and that develops a, that results in cerebral edema and you can develop a, a seizure that is called as a rehydration seizure. But this is seen only in the pediatric population and it is not actually uh, uh, explained in adult population. So in adult population, what you should be more worried is about under correcting and result and the under correction resulting in a uh, cell shrinkage or an osmotic demyelination syndrome. So, uh, so what I would say is when you when we see a case of hypernatremia, uh, symptomatic hypernatremia or hypernatremia in a really sick patient, uh, one thing what you should always keep in mind: this is associated with increased mortality. Most of these patients will have multi multiple comorbidities, and this is going to add up to your mortality. So the first and foremost thing is see if the patient is having adequate urine output. Patient is having a good urine output. Patient is not overloaded. Then and it's and if it's a chronic hypernatremia, administer five percent dextrose at a rate of one point three five mL per hour, maximum one fifty mL per hour. Monitor sodium every three hourly, and you try to get a drop in sodium at a rate of what point five millimole per hour. Now, if the patient is not having a good urine output, then you should. You, you should be a little more conservative in your fluid administration. And if the hypernatremia is really bad, think of dialysis. If the patient is having hyperglycemia or if it's a diabetic patient, in that case, you can give 0.45 normal saline along with your free water through Rhymes tube or orally at a rate of, and this 0.45 normal saline should be a little higher. It should be around 2 to 3 uh, uh, ml per kg per hour. So this is a very simple way of dealing with in ICU, when you cannot calculate, your mind doesn't work with all these calculations. It's a very simple way of approaching. One, one, one last question is again, uh, when you do dialysis, what is the sodium, dialysis sodium that is set it to? Like suppose so you again, have 165, 165 you know, sodium in the patient. What dialysis sodium will you set it to and how long will you dialyze? Because how will we make out the drop in sodium? Is it by measurement? So I think our, our the machines we have, I think as a maximum setting is up to 155. So uh, I, I, I think that is the maximum which we can set. Uh, again, uh, the drop should not be more than, more than 10 in 24 hours. So we'll have to monitor sodium again uh, after the dialysis and uh, uh, withhold 5% exposed if the, the target sodium is more than 10 millivolt. I think our, the, if I'm not correct, sir, the, uh, the dialysis machine, routine dialysis machine, I think the upper limit is 155 if I'm, if I'm correct, sir. Yeah, it, it, I think it depends on the setting of the machine, I guess, or what the calibration is. Some okay. people may go up to 145, some people may go, you, yeah, you can go higher, but I think the calibration. Once again, I apologize for all the delay and the technical no. issues. It's all, it was all my, uh, the problems at my uh, home. Once again, okay. I apologize for your time uh, that I took. And thank you for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity, sir, for speaking uh, uh, in front of this audience. It's a real big honor for me. It was a very nice presentation, uh, Sony. The wonderful presentation, very clear. And and I'm going to distribute your slides with your permission uh, yes, to sir. all those who are interested. Yeah. So, sure. Sir. Thank you very much.